on the 8th of September 2022, on the death of his mother, Elizabeth II, Queen of the United Kingdom, Prince Charles became King Charles III. I want to do a video discussing the remarkable appreciation King Charles has for Islam. I am not here to endorse or criticise the monarchy. I am just highlighting the refreshingly positive writings and statements about Islam made by the new king when he was Prince of Wales. I think it is a matter of considerable public interest to know these facts. In a speech entitled Islam and the West, given at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, he said, and I quote, It is odd in many ways that misunderstandings between Islam and the West should persist. For what binds our two worlds together is so much more powerful than that which divides us. Muslims, Christians and Jews are all peoples of the book. And here Charles uses a Quranic expression. Islam and Christianity share a common monotheistic vision, a belief in one God, in the transience of our earthly life in our accountability for our actions and in the assurance of life to come. We share many key values in common, respect for knowledge, for justice, compassion towards the poor and underprivileged, the importance of family life, respect for parents. Honour thy father and mother is a Quranic precept too. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles continues, if there is much misunderstanding in the West about the nature of Islam, there is also much ignorance about the debt our own culture and civilization owe to the Muslim world. It is a failure which stems, I think, from the straitjacket of history we have inherited. The medieval Islamic world, from Central Asia to the shores of the Atlantic, was a world where scholars and men of learning flourished. But because we have tended to see Islam as the enemy of the West, as an alien culture, society and system of belief, we have tended to ignore or erase its great relevance to our own history. For example, we have underestimated the importance of 800 years of Islamic society and culture in Spain between the 8th and the 15th centuries. The contribution of Muslim Spain to the preservation of classical learning during the Dark Ages, that time of intellectual and cultural decline in the West, and to the first flowerings of the Renaissance has long been recognised. But Islamic Spain, said Charles, was much more than a mere larder where Hellenistic knowledge was kept for later consumption by the emerging Western world. Not only did Muslim Spain gather and preserve the intellectual content of ancient Greek and Roman civilization, it also interpreted and expanded upon that civilization and made a vital contribution of its own in so many fields of human endeavor. In science, astronomy, mathematics, algebra, itself an Arabic word, law, history, medicine, pharmacology, optics, agriculture, architecture, theology, and music. Islam nurtured and preserved the quest for learning. In the words of the tradition, the ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr. Cordoba in the 10th century was by far the most civilized city of Europe. We know of lending libraries in Spain at the time King Alfred was making terrible blunders with the culinary arts in this country. It is said that 
the 400,000 volumes in its ruler's library amounted to more books than all the libraries of the rest of Europe put together. That was made possible because the Muslim world acquired from China the skill of making paper more than 400 years before the rest of non-Muslim Europe. Many of the traits on which modern Europe prides it itself came to it from Muslim Spain. Diplomacy, free trade, open borders, the techniques of academic research, of anthropology, etiquette, fashion, alternative medicine, hospitals, all came from this great city of cities. Medieval Islam was a religion of remarkable tolerance for its time. Now, this is an insight that Charles makes, which is rarely appreciated in the West, and I'm glad he is aware of it. Medieval Islam was a religion of remarkable tolerance for its time, he says, allowing Jews and Christians the right to practice their inherited beliefs and setting an example which was not, unfortunately, copied for many centuries in the West. The surprise, ladies and gentlemen, is the extent to which Islam has been a part of Europe for so long. So Charles here is saying how crucial it is we understand Islam is a part of European history. It's not kind of an alien other from immigrants. It's part of the intrinsic history of Europe itself. First in Spain, he says, then in the Balkans, and the extent to which it has contributed so much towards the civilization which we all too think of wrongly as entirely Western, i.e. non-Muslim. Islam is part of our past and present in all fields of human endeavor. It has helped create modern Europe. It is part of our own inheritance, not a thing apart. More than this, said Charles, Islam can teach us today. So he said, this is the future king saying what Islam can teach us as a non-Muslim country, uh, England, Britain. Islam can teach us today a way of understanding and living in the world which Christianity itself is poorer for having lost. At the heart of Islam, and this is a great insight uh, uh, that Charles is making, I think, at the heart of Islam is its preservation of an integral view of the universe. Islam refuses to separate man and nature, religion and science, mind and matter, and has preserved a metaphysical and unified view of ourselves and the world around us. End quote. This is a fraction of the speech, by the way. I'll, I'll link to it in the description below. In, a, in another speech uh, at the Sacred Web Conference, now this is a Sufi Islamic kind of conference, which you can read online. Interestingly, he praised a book uh, by René Guénon, The Reign of Quantity. And here is uh, the book itself. Uh, I do recommend it. Um, now, he said about this book, intriguingly, many find this teaching difficult, the teaching of René Guénon, not least because he asks us to question our very mode of being, and perhaps because he asks us to question an ideology in the form of modernism that has become so set in our minds that any other way of being seems in some sense fanciful and unrealistic. End quote. Now, what's interesting is René Guénon was a French Muslim convert. He was a mathematician, brilliant, brilliant man in Paris. He converted to Islam, moved to Cairo, actually, and was uh, known as a traditionalist Sufi. Charles clearly agrees with many aspects of his worldview. If you read the speech, you'll see other examples. He also quotes approvingly some of the works of Professor Syed Nasser. Syed Nasser is a very uh, prominent, uh, now American, uh, professor in uh, the States. He was originally Iranian, a uh, brilliant uh, individual. Also, Martin Lings. Now, Martin Lings is very interesting. And I want to read a few lines from this book, 
It's called A Return to the Spirit, Questions and Answers by Martin Lings. It was published just after Martin Lings' death and contains some of his writings, plus a number of essays and appreciations by his admirers. One of these admirers just happens to be the King Charles III. Who was Martin Lings, by the way? Well, Martin Lings was an English convert to Islam, uh, a very well-known Sufi, um, and he was the author of a very famous book. And this is what Charles says in the, um, the introduction. Uh, it's under the official crest, Clarence House. And he signed his name at the bottom, Charles. And this is one sentence I want to read to you. One of Martin Ling's greatest legacies was his remarkable biography of the prophet Muhammad. Now, this is the book in question. Now, I've done many, many videos reading chapter after chapter from this book. Muhammad is life based on the earliest sources by Martin Lings. Many, many people consider this to be the greatest trans, uh, the greatest biography, Sira, of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, in the English language. Not without its faults, but it is a beautiful literary work and I highly recommend it. So does Prince Charles. He thinks it's an amazing book. So he's praising here a book uh, written by a prominent English Muslim about the last prophet sent to mankind, Muhammad, upon whom be peace. So that's what Prince Charles thinks about that book, which is remarkable. But just, but Martin Ling, as I say, was a convert to Islam. He, he died some time ago uh, and a very prominent Sufi. So clearly Charles is attracted to Sufism rather than other forms, uh, other expressions, I should say, of Islamic spirituality or teaching. Now, just in conclusion, uh, to be clear, I am not saying King Charles is a closet Muslim, but he is clearly literate in some aspects of Islamic thought and metaphysics. This is unparalleled in the history of the British monarchy. I'm also not suggesting that Muslims as Muslims should back the new king. My intention in this video is simply to give a glimpse of what he thinks about Islam. So Muslims in the UK can decide for themselves how best to engage King Charles III in dialogue and discussion. Inshallah. Till next time.